All right. Today I'm going to talk about bike shedding. Some of you probably heard of the term. You probably haven't heard of the term that it actually goes by, which is Parkinson's law of triviality. So who's Parkinson? Are you going to work? You're not going to work. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> It's like an oncoming train. <laughs> All right, it's not working, whatever. That's because it's not on. Hi, I'm awake. That's Parkinson, C. Northcote Parkinson. He wrote a book, but first he was a naval historian for Britain, actually. And the book was about management, and you might find yourself wondering why a naval historian wrote a book about management. I did too. And it turns out there's a lot of management in you know, the British Navy. And so he had a lot of chances to watch people do things and people go through the process of management and processes of talking about things and engaging with things. So this is Parkinson's law. It's not Parkinson's law of triviality, but he wrote a book that was all about this law, which is that paperwork is actually elastic and it will expand to fill all of the time you actually have, which given that the man paid a lot of attention to bureaucracy makes perfect sense. So don't confuse yourself, this is the not the right law, but you may see this referred to as Parkinson's law. This is the actual one we wanna talk about. The amount of time spent on an item in the agenda is inversely proportionate to the amount of money involved. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, consider this, Fort Calhoun nuclear reactor. It covers 660 acres, it generates 484 milliwatts, Megawatts, excuse me, <laughs> only milliwatts. There's about 600,000 to 800,000 pounds of nuclear material on site, nuclear waste material on site, uh, which I didn't know until I started looking this up, which is awesome. Uh, the population within 50 miles is about 953,000 people, includes most of Omaha. And it took $180 million just to recommission the thing after the 2011 floods. It's big, it's complicated, it's expensive. It's really hard to understand. On the other hand, take the Walton's Tongue and Groove Apex wooden bike shed. <laughs> it is seven feet by three feet. It is factory dip treated so the wood will not rot. It has a 10 millimeter solid, wood board, solid sheet board floor. It has a 10 year anti-rot guarantee and it is available for only 199 pounds and 95 pence directly from Walton's uh, online store, shipping not included. This is a lot less complicated than a nuclear reactor. It's simple, it's made of wood, you can build it in a weekend, it, hell, it probably comes pre-built to some extent. Bike sheds are inherently more simple than nuclear reactors. And so we come to the crux of what bike shedding actually is. Parkinson described a meeting that he was at. It was a member of the Joint Welfare Committee. They had three items on the agenda. One was the signing of a $10 million contract for a new, building a nuclear reactor. One was the proposal to build a 350 pound bike shed. And one was the proposal to spend 21 pounds a year on coffee for the Joint Welfare Committee. Here are the outcomes that he recorded, the amount of time taken per agenda item. They approved the reactor in two and a half minutes. Everybody was like, yeah, okay. That's a nuclear reactor. I have no idea what the hell that is or how it works. It's probably nuclear things involved somewhere. It makes power, check. On the other hand, the bike shed, 45 minutes of discussion. One of the members was like, I think it should have an asbestos roof instead of an aluminum roof. The other member said, asbestos is way too expensive. What you want is galvanized steel. One of the members said, I don't even think we should have a bike shed. And the other two members turned around and yelled at him. Quoting directly from Parkinson here, he says, the debate is fairly launched. A sum of 350 pounds is well within everybody's comprehension. And a discussion goes on, therefore, for 45 minutes, saving about 50 pounds. At length, members sit back with a feeling of great accomplishment. The coffee, the last item on the agenda, Quoting again from Parkinson, there may be members of the committee who might fail to distinguish between asbestos and galvanized steel, but every man knows what coffee is and has an opinion on where it should be bought, how it should be brewed, and whether it should be bought at all. They literally argued for the remainder of the time 
and wound up ending the meeting by asking the secretary for more details about the coffee and deciding to reconvene about the coffee next meeting. This is bike shedding. This is when you spend so much time on the inconsequential, the trivial, the functionally useless to your project or to your team, to things you're working on, that you completely ignore the giant nuclear reactor in the room. The thing that actually matters and is really important that you get right and make sure that people have done their work. So why does this even exist? Why does this happen? Well, the human brain has these two states that you can know something and understand it or you really can't. And especially if you're operating at a middle manager level, if you don't understand something, you kind of assume that somebody else has validated it. The engineers who produced this or provided you with the stuff, they must have done their legwork. They must have done the, the, you know, I assume that they did a good job. Why would it be otherwise? On the other hand, if you know and understand, you want to prove that you were valuable. And not even just from a sense of like, I secretly know that my job is worthless and doesn't mean anything. On any project that you're working on, you want to make your stamp, you want to make your mark, you want to do this, you want to put your initials in concrete, somewhere that you can point at and say, I did this thing, this was me. So in computer science, we have this guy to thank, Paul, or Paul Henningkamp, he was the one who brought bike shedding into the concept of computer science. And he did it on the FreeBSD mailing list back in 1999. And he did it in the context of developers arguing each other endlessly about how features should be designed, which is another way of looking at bike shedding. But today we're going to focus on the UX side of things. So if you have a UX design, and all of the UX people in the room, please refrain from throwing up. You have a UX design that you spent a lot of time and effort on and you think it looks really cool. And the client wanders in and the client says, well, I want it to be more swoopy. <laughs> and it should be more dynamic blue because this blue is too passive. Make it more active blue. And you ask the client what active blue is, and they look at you and they're like, you're the designer. <laughs> so how does this happen? Why, you know, this is the client coming in and attempting to bike shed at you. They're attempting to spend time on things that don't functionally matter. They're attempting to spend time on the things that they understand, the color, the fonts, the sizes of things, the relative sizes of things. They're not focusing on the UX. They're not focusing on the design because that's hard to them. Or it might be that they actually are focusing on the design because they think they actually understand. So what can you do about it? Well, there's two ways. The legit way starts with actually doing design studios with the client. And this may sound pretty obvious, but what's happening here is you're sitting down with the client and you're trying <laughs> to divide things so that you build a list of things that they have to make the decisions on. Things that they have to decide. You know, things where they know the users better than you do, or things where they have to make the decisions about how their code works or their, their industry works, the legislation that controls their industry. So you're making them a part of the process and giving them something that they can do that changes the project. The other part of the legit way is to break things down into objective UX, which is to say things that you've done user studies on, things that you can point to, publish papers on that say, well, this is easier for humans to understand. It's easier for humans to read san or serif fonts in long form. It's easier for humans to read non-serif fonts if they're just scanning across a web page. That's not subjective. So these are the things that you don't budge on, but you give your client a whole pile of the superficial things, the subjective UX. Things like, well, this should be this shade of color, or this should be this particular font, this maybe they want flat design. Those things, sometimes they matter, sometimes they fall in objective UX, but most of the time they're kind of over here subjective. So those are the things that you take to the client and you say, okay, you get to make your mark here. Now you don't lay it out like that, like you're giving them a sandbox. They're not, probably not gonna take to that well. But you structure the question such that they're offering feedback on these things. And then they can make their mark there and the benefit is that those are the things they're probably going to see more than these anyway. You can also do a sneaky thing. Uh, it's called the duck method. I don't know if you guys ever played battle chess, but it was this game on a lot of different platforms back in the day, actually. But you could play chess, and the characters would go around and kill each other. And, and you know, be animated on the screen. So the guy who was designing the queen knew that his producer was somebody who liked to put his mark on things. So he designed the queen with a pet duck that would follow her around and flap on you know, the periphery of her animation screen, her, her sprite styles, and was really annoying and, uh, and incredibly ugly. So when he went to the producer, the producer looked at it for a second and said, okay, great, just nix the duck. It, you can provide something for the client that is easy for them to kind of go, oh, I can help, 
and they'll get rid of it. The problem is, and most of the UX people will probably tell you, this can backfire, and it will backfire sometimes. <laughs> so be careful where you use it. Don't like, make really intensive choices this way. That's pretty much it. Any questions? On your objective and subjective UX slide, uh, what about domain-specific workflows? Is that, where's the objective, subjective? I think that kind of, depending on the, the question of involved, some of that can fall into the things only they can decide. Like if they have things about, like when Nate was working at Conductix Monthly, that you have to test something this way, that's a workflow only they can provide you. So if that's the workflow, that's the workflow and the way it works. <coughs> so finding out whether it is objective or subjective is also part of that design studio process. Any other questions? Was us choosing the talk you uh, zipping bike shitting? That question is too meta and <laughs> I reject it. <laughs> Possibly. You won't commit? No. Nope. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you. Thanks.